band had to leave quite a, a while ago, but they were really fucking cool. Uh, Sprakabani, am I saying that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're really, really cool. It's just like super incredible to see. And then, of course, uh, I, I spent the entire afternoon listening to I Adapt at a year's house, and uh, so to see I Adapt 2 or I Adapt Junior or whatever you're calling it uh, was pretty great. And then uh, thanks, of course, to Gadavir for uh, finally answering a question which I've been asking myself for 30 years, which is how few people uh, does it take to still qualify for a circle pit? And the answer is three. And I, I learned that tonight. I didn't, I, I didn't realize that, and I thought about it, because ultimately, like, two people cir circle pitting is just like an angry line. Just like the, <laughs> and one, I guess, is just a very dizzy person. But three qualifies. That was an actual circle pit for 30 seconds with 30 people. It was pretty good. Yeah. So uh, also thank you to this Aida uh, for putting together what is a very unusual tour, uh, a tour, a spoken word tour of Iceland, and I appreciate all of you coming out to hang out, to listen, and to participate in something that's so unusual. I met uh, Aida a few years ago at Fluff Fest under very unusual circumstances too. Um, I, I every year at Fluff Fest in the Czech Republic, it's a you know a punk festival. It's incredible. There's a table. Uh, Robert from Refuse Records has a table, and I hide basically in back of his table the entire festival from beginning to end, and uh, just just weirdly antisocial, I guess, or whatever it is. I just hide behind the table, and people come up and say hi, and I say hi, and then I'm safe back there with Robert. And if you don't know Robert, and I assume many of you don't, he's uh, he comes across as very serious, but he's very fun. Uh, but he's just kind of standing there with me the entire time. And a couple years ago, this guy walks up to the table and he says, uh, hello. And he's very, you know, excited. And I say, hello. And he says, uh, I am from Iceland. And I'm like, holy shit, that's really cool. I didn't know there was, you know, many hardcore people in Iceland. He's like, there's 20 and I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, that's, uh, that's awesome. So uh, we talked for a little while and uh, I just, my mind is going. I'm like, I, I need to find out about this amazing place where there's 20 hardcore people. And uh, at, at the end of this conversation, I said, listen, you know, we should keep in touch. My name is, my name is Greg. And he says, my name is Aida. And, he, and we shake hands, and he walks away. And I, I, I turned to Robert, and I said, uh, what was his name? And Robert is like, I, I do not know it. And uh, I'm like, OK. Uh, so, I've Robert for 10 years. I know, but, but he's just like, I do not know it. He's like, I do not know. And he's like, I said, but he said it. And, and Robert's like, I don't, I don't, he couldn't say it. He couldn't say the name. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's an unusual name for me, too. I'm not used to hearing that. So the next day, you come back to the table again. We're talking more and more. And I tried to do my Facebook trick, which I've done all over the world. And it works really, really well. The Facebook trick works like this. Most people these days are using Instagram rather than Facebook, of course. So if you're talking to somebody at a hardcore show in another country and you don't know their name, it's a great idea partway through the conversation to just say, uh, hey, we're, we're friends on Facebook, right? 90% of people will say, no, 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 we follow each other on Instagram. And then they'll say their screen name because most people don't use their name as their screen name. So they think, oh, you've forgotten my screen name because it's Dick Punch 666 or whatever. <laughs> so they say, like, no, no, we follow each other on Instagram. I'm Dick Punch 666. And then I pull out my phone. I'm like, oh, oh, sweet, okay. And then I look up, you know, Dick Punch 666, ostensibly, like, as if I'm looking up their latest post to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you posted the thing of your sandwich. That's awesome. But what I'm really doing is, like, some people's name is there. So then I can be like, oh, yeah, 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 awesome. Mike. Cool. Um, and I remember their name. So uh, I, I tried the Facebook trick on, on Ayir, and I failed miserably. He comes back the next day, and I'm like, we're Facebook, we're Facebook friends, right? And he just goes, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, now what do I do? I have no idea what happens next in this situation. So he walks away again, and I said, I said, Robert, do you know how to spell his name? So I can look up on Facebook, and Robert is like, I do not know it. It has two letters, which are one. It makes no sense. To me. And I'm like, fuck. So uh, it took the third day when I was finally like, I'm so sorry, my friend. What is your name? I'm the dumbest American in the world right now. And he's like, Ayir. I'm like, I'm sorry. He's like, Ayir. I'm like, oh god, I have to ask again. I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, Ayir. And finally, he's like spelling it. I'm just like, I don't understand, but you're awesome. Uh, so we became friends, and ever since then, that was um, a crowning moment. So thank you for putting all of these things together. I really appreciate it very much. It's so cool. So, uh, so I was excited, very, very, very excited to come to Iceland and speak um, for, for many reasons. One, because I've only been here like as like a typical tourist passenger layover guy, you know, a couple times. 
Uh, but also, you know, people back at home were kind of shocked, amazed, and surprised at a thriving hardcore scene in, in Iceland. And I've done a bit of research, and I've gotten a couple records and whatnot, and people back at home were asking me, like, what's the deal? Like, you're going to speak in Iceland, like, to who? And I'm like, fuck you, there's people who live there. It's not like, the country's name is not, like, literal. It's not only ice and land. There's human <laughs> beings, like, that's part of the equation. And I'm like, there's actually, like, hardcore people, you know? And I mean, I, I you know, I couldn't explain to them that, like, they're all represented here tonight, but basically it's like there are people involved in, in a scene, you know, and, and people are asking me, like, what do they sing about? And I've had the, the Gallagher 7-inch, you gave it to me last year, I think you gave it to me last year, and I was explaining, like, they sing about things that we all universally sing about in hardcore and punk rock. It's not like they're in Iceland singing about how much they hate aluminum smelting and tourists. It's like they're going to get by singing about the things that we sing about as well. And um, people were really excited, and I was really excited. So the way that this all came together was very unusual if we trace back the history even further. Um, I'm here tonight basically because of vegan sausages. Um, what happened was two years ago, I was on a 22-hour layover at, at the airport, and I landed, and I thought, what am I going to do for 22 hours? I don't know anyone here at the time. And I picked up the, uh, what is it, the grapevine? Is that the name of the paper, the grapevine? I think. So I picked up the grapevine. And I just thought, I'll read this, and then sit here, and 22 hours later, if I'm still alive and sane, I'll get on a plane and fly away. And I've been vegan for, uh, if next year will be 30 years, like since before it was cool, like a long fucking time. And I was like, oh my god, vegan sausages? This is the coolest country in the entire world. Like, what is this that in their main paper they're talking about vegan sausages? And it said in the article, this guy is in Reykjavik, he's making vegan sausages, they're for sale at this one shop. And I'm like, all right, this is what I'm doing for the next 22 hours. So I'm gonna go find the shop and buy sausages. So I take a bus into town and I walk around and I manage to find the shop and I change money and I buy two things of sausages and a big thing of bread and some tomatoes and I made myself sandwiches and I walked around your city for like 10 hours eating vegan sausage sandwiches and I was the happiest tourist that's ever existed. <laughs> And, uh, and and I, I was just amazed. And I've always loved hot springs, always. I spent some time in Japan, like a month in Japan a bunch of years ago, and sat in hot springs. And the Japanese, like, they would go head to head and fight the shit out of you over the hot springs game. Like, they've got it going on in Japan. Uh, but I thought, okay, Iceland is cool, and the people here seem very nice and are obviously intense because they live on a combination of a volcano and a potential earthquake, so cool. Uh, I will pursue hot springs. I went into a bookstore. I asked for the best book on hot springs that they had. They sold me a book on hot springs, and I made a promise to myself. I was like, I'm going to come back to Iceland. I'm going to drive around the country by myself, and I'm going to go to hot springs. And I'm not going to go to the typical ones. I'm going to find the weird ones on some guy's farm, like 300 kilometers away, that's like this big, and only one human can fit in it. I'm going to all of those that I possibly can. So, um, so I am here uh, largely for that reason. Like I wanted to go to hot springs, and I did actually follow through and sit in hot springs for the last 10 days all over your country, and it was, like, mind-boggling, like, just uh, incredible. Like, I mean, you know that your country is majestic and beautiful, but we don't realize that in the States. We are getting inundated. Like, everywhere is Iceland. You cannot move without seeing Iceland in advertising in the United States, in magazines. You know, come to Iceland. It's beautiful. And it's like, it, it never captures how incredible it is. And in the airports, every airport says, come to Iceland. And everywhere you see advertising, come to Iceland. And it's always these, like, dreamy, ethereal, like, Iceland, beautiful land of fire and ice and, like, you know, some Game of Thronesy tie-in type of thing. But it doesn't capture how amazing it is. <laughs> it, it's true. And it's like, you, you could totally up your game. I mean, you've already got all the tourists in the world. But you could totally up your game. I mean, you're known worldwide as, like, some of the nicest people on the planet. You could up your game and be total dicks and still get, like, a... a huge amount of tourists because the scenery here is so beautiful that if you change the like the current Iceland tourism board like their motto is like inspired in Iceland or inspired by Iceland I mean you could change it to your country fuck you Iceland and still get all the tourists and people would come and be like oh my god this place is unbelievable because I was driving around for 10 days completely enthralled and amazed by it so uh yeah so that's I mean ultimately why I'm here and I skipped uh the Blue Lagoon everybody back at home is asking me are you gonna go to the Blue Lagoon I'm like Absolutely not. It's like Times Square with water. Like, why would I want to go like to like such a place? It's like terrifying. So I, I skipped that. And I skipped all like the major like the major tourist sites and just was by myself sleeping in a truck for ten days and it was absolutely unbelievable. So I was super happy about it. But um, yes. Yeah, so, okay. So the point of like why I'm actually actually here is that uh, 
you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot. Oh, and one other point, one other point, actually. The, the one moment that I actually felt very solidly like home was I went to uh, the National Park. I, mean, I know I'm going to say it wrong. Ding, ding Villiers. Am I saying that even close to, <coughs> close yeah, to right? Ding, ding Villiers. Okay. So I went, to, I went, I went there, and uh, I did the, the golden circle thing. And I was like, all right, whatever. So driving around. And, uh, but I went to the National Park, and I felt um, slightly at home there for a moment because when you pay at the, at the park, you know, there's like right as far as away as you are, you pay, and as far away as you are, there's a sign that says like 72 people were murdered here uh, hundreds of years ago, and I'm like, oh hell yeah, this is like being in the states where like everyone was murdered everywhere and still is all the time, right? You go to national parks, it's like, oh wow, this is so beautiful, and like I grew up in in New England in, in the Northeast, and people all the time are like, oh New England is so beautiful, it's so quaint, it's so wonderful, I'm like. Yeah, and you know, we like burned witches, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago. Basically, women who were outspoken, we burned them. Everyone's dead, you know. And now I live on the West Coast, and it's like people are like, "Oh my gosh, the West Coast is so relaxed, it's so beautiful, it's so amazing." I'm like, "Yep, it used to be populated with Native Americans. White people came over, infected everybody with smallpox. Whoever survived, we shot." Uh, everybody's dead. So it was kind of nice to be here and be like, oh wow, this is kind of cool. Like Iceland's totally beautiful. Wait a minute. Oh, you burned all the men and drowned all the women. Everybody's dead. Cool. It's like being at home. <laughs> so, um, so it was cool. Uh, not really cool, but you know what I mean. It was. Uh, it, uh, it made me feel at home. Um, but greater point. The greater point of, of why I wanted to come and speak. Um, so I had a, a really uh, interesting and really difficult uh, year this last year. Uh, to be to be totally honest. And uh, I had like uh, I had a lot of time over the last couple months to reflect on, on my year. What had basically happened was uh, I have a, a long legacy of, of being in relationships that don't work out. And I think that I'm, it's one of the things that I do best uh, is be in relationships that don't work out. Um, I'm not proud of that and I'm happy with it. Uh, being single is like equally fun and the worst thing that's ever happened in the world. Um, but it's true. But, uh, it, but absolutely true that what had happened was uh, I did everything right. And when I say I did everything right, um, what they say is that when you date enough that you get completely sick of dating, you will finally find the person that you're supposed to be with. And uh, I did that. I, I dated to the point where I was so sick of dating that I was just like, if I swipe on another human being, I'm going to chop my own goddamn thumb off just so I never have to do this activity again on my phone. Like, I was so sick of it. And I, and I met somebody who was quite amazing. And people also said that when you least expect it, you'll meet this person. And that's exactly what happened. And people also say that when you meet the person you're supposed to be with, the differences between you and them won't matter. Like I can sit and say, well, I'm vegan, and I can say that I'm straight edge, and I can say this, I'm involved in hardcore, and I want to find somebody who's vegan, straight edge, and who cares? When you meet the person that you're supposed to be with, they say, it doesn't matter. They could be a meat-eating you know, beer drinking metalhead. I mean, that sounds actually kind of awesome. Um, but uh, not except for the meat part, but whatever, you know, I'll, I'll deal with it, you know. But anyway, so point is, and I met that person, and I was like, holy shit, and the differences don't matter. And um, uh, that that's exactly all of the things that took place when I met this person. And they also said, as soon as you meet the person you're supposed to be with, there won't be any games or any thinking or any anything it's just gonna be very real, and you're gonna know right there. And I was like, that's just bullshit. There's no way that that's a thing. Like, this is not a thing. And uh, when I, when this person wrote me on Instagram and we started chatting, uh, I Googled her, as we do these days, just to make sure she wasn't an, an assassin or a ninja or a killer or something. Which, I mean, that's, that might, might have heightened the game. I'd be able to come up like, so-and-so, assassin, ninja. I'd be like, here you go. Um, it'd be pretty badass to date a ninja or an assassin, especially if they could tell you what they did, like, at night and who they were killing. But, uh, sidebar. But anyway, so uh, I Googled this person, and a video came up. And the video was of her talking about uh, art and creativity. And I was in London, it was two in the morning, I was on tour, and I was on my friend's couch, and I was like, God damn it, I'm going to watch one minute of this video. And the second, you know, I, I start watching it, I know I'm going to be over it. Like, I'm not going to watch this video in its entirety, because it was an hour long. Uh, I turned on this video of her, and it was her talking in an interview situation about, about art and creativity. And the second the video came on, I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this person. No question about it. And I watched the entire video all the way through. And when it got to the end, I watched the entire video all the way through again, uh, all the way to the end. And I knew, I was like, game on. So if I tell you the details and the ins and outs of the situation, you'll be bored shitless. We've all been through relationships that didn't work out and breakups and whatnot. 
But what ultimately happened is that the relationship didn't work. And it didn't work uh, pretty dramatically, I guess you'd say. Like there was a lot of love and a lot of breakup and a lot of not working. And I found myself on Christmas Eve in the midst of a breakup, which is a bad night to break up with anybody. Uh, so when I and my partner decided that we weren't going to see each other anymore on Christmas Eve, that basically ruins like life. Like you don't wake up Christmas morning thinking, I'm single now, that's my present. No, you wake up and you're just like, fuck me. Uh, and that's kind of what it felt like. And in addition, in addition to that, I woke up Christmas morning uh, to pictures of her and an ex uh, together online. And I was like, wow, that's a Christmas present that I never wanted to receive. So uh, I was just doomed, destroyed. And I was in New York City at the time, walking around New York, feeling like my life was over. And uh, over the next week, things got worse. And finally, I had to say to her, like, like, we're like done. Like, there's no more. Like, we are not in touch anymore. So why does that tie into why I'm here? Because I made a choice. I made a choice, and I said to myself, OK, I've lost something that was very meaningful to me and somebody that was very meaningful to me. And I have, an, I have a couple options. And one of them was to feel terrible. And I did that for a very long time, up until like, I don't know, like three hours ago. Uh, I mean, a very long time. It felt terrible. But the other thing that I did was I said, now I'm going to do the things that I've always said that I'm going to do and that I don't ever end up doing. And the Iceland idea of driving around the country and sitting in hot springs is one of them. I also made myself promises year ago, years ago that I would tour everywhere I could in the world and speak no matter how awkward it was, no matter how un uncomfortable it was, in whatever room I could, whether it was 30 people in a room in Iceland or five people in a room in Russia or whatever, and I've made a point to like continue to do that stuff, and I was like, okay, Iceland, top of the list. And I wrote Tyre, and I'm like, hey, uh, I'm heartbroken and crying as I type. Can we tour? Um, and he was like, let's, let's do this, and he set up, he set up this tour. So one of the reasons, and the main reason that I, I came here and wanted to come here was because when we lose something that's so meaningful to us, it creates incredible opportunities. It creates incredible opportunities to see what we can use to fill that empty space. And I know that for myself, I get addicted to my own pain. I get addicted to the way that I suffer. I get addicted to the way that I am broken up with or broken up, or the one who breaks up, or whatever it is, I get addicted to that whole narrative, that whole story. And rather than sit around in Seattle, I wanted to go out and extend outward into the world and, and, and meet people and connect and talk about what happens when we create opportunities out of, out of like, a void. Uh, I think the human beings are really, really good at getting excited and used to our pain. And I think in hardcore punk, we, we, we walk a very fine line sometimes between using our pain in some incredibly potentially progressive way to actually create something new and wallowing in it and returning to it again and again and again and again and again and again without breaking out. And I've tried to check myself as much as I can over the course of my life so I don't get locked into that cycle. And I do, I do it, we all do it, I do it too. But with this tour specifically, I want to get out and, and connect with people and really and see what happened. And while driving around your country, something really interesting happened. When I landed at the airport 11 days ago, um, you were in the United States, right? And the, Suzanne, you, you weren't here yet. Ten, Czech Republic. Yeah, you were in the Czech Republic. Yeah, so I knew no one in the country. I actually knew zero humans in your entire country. So I, I land, and I'm like, okay, the two people I know in the country, gone. I know nobody here. I've got this rented car, and I've got 10 days. What do I do? And there was a moment when I turned the ignition in the rental car, and I was like, holy shit, I'm actually genuinely afraid right now. And it wasn't afraid like I'm going to crash the rental car or I'm going to get charged for like a windshield or like ash damage. Like, bless you guys. Like, there's nowhere else in the, in the world where you can rent a car and get fucked over because ash damaged the car other than in Iceland. Like, that was so bizarre. But uh, whatever. Point is, I turned the ignition. I was genuinely afraid. And the, the fear wasn't like a terror of money, like I said, that damaged the car. It was like, what do you do when you've got 10 days that are open? What do you do when you've got no partner? What do you do when you've got only open road? What do you do when you've got a full tank of gas? And the terror of the potential of the experience was so overwhelming that I almost couldn't drive. Like, I almost couldn't go anywhere. I was like, what do I do when I could do whatever I want? I was like, okay, I just, I'm just going to start driving. 
So I drove out to the peninsula, I drove the West Fjords, and I spent like four days out there driving around like like on roads that I probably shouldn't. And uh, and it was incredibly eye-opening, incredibly like, I mean, you've all driven out there, I'm sure, and it was just, there's moments where you're like, oh, cool, this road is made out of dirt on a mountain that's sliding down itself, and death is imminent, and here I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just bizarre for me. But what it did was it, 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 it showed me, like, I, I would feel exhilarated at times, a different type of fear. And I was like, holy shit, that's something. Like, I'm feeling something. And, like, what a gift it is for us in the world that we've created where we're so safe all the time in terms of how we interact with one another. Even in punk rock and hardcore, we're so safe with how we appear and how we present. What a gift it is to actually feel something, whether that's something powerful at a show, whether that's some uh, a moment of terror within you. And, you know, driving on these roads, I was like, holy shit, I'm actually, like, exhilarated, like, goosebumps. Like, this is cool. Like, life is here. Like, this is exactly what I wanted from my Iceland experience. And I remembered back as I was driving, like, any time I've gone through any breakup, any bad experience, a death, a loss, it's how we fill that experience that, that, that really makes the transformative moment happen. And I remembered years ago... There was, uh, I went through this, another crazy breakup, but uh, the, the details don't even matter. But I went to India. I flew to India and I did the same thing. I, I, I wandered around India for a few weeks just to like connect with people. And uh, there was a moment where I was on a train in a really rural part of India. And I'd gotten on this train by myself. And what you need to know to have this story make sense, and this is probably the weirdest thing that I've said yet, is that I made my living for many years as a, a juggler and performer. And like a juggler who'd like do tricks at like outdoor street performing and like would like ride a unicycle and would like blow up balloons and stuff like that for kids and that sort of thing. Like I made my living doing that for years. You need that to understand the story. And I know in your head you're like, the fuck did he just say? But yeah, you need that. So anyway, so I'm on this train in rural India, okay? And uh, I'm on this train in rural India and I'm by myself and I'm sad and I'm just like, what am I doing here? What's going to happen? This is so nuts. And I'm just for hours going to be on this train. And trains in India are unlike trains anywhere else that I've found. They're basically open boxcars with bench seats in them. So I'm sitting by myself on this bench seat in this vastly open boxcar, just rumbling across India. And all of a sudden, the train stops in this tiny little town. And when it stops... A family gets on, a mom and a dad, and a boy and a girl. And they sit down on the bench seat right across from me in this boxcar. And they just start staring at me. Has anyone been to India before? No one. Okay, so this is a cultural thing, and it's pretty it's pretty wild. You've been to India? You, but you know the cultural thing. You know it. Yeah, you know it. So, so what happens in India is that people stare. They just stare. And we typically don't do that in, in our culture. Like we don't, I'm not just gonna sit here and just stare at you awkwardly if I don't know you on the street. And even right now, the eye contact is okay because we know each other now because we met last night. But if it goes on for another five minutes, you're gonna be like, what's happening? Are we gonna like fight each other or like have sex? <laughs> so like, it's just weird, right? So, and especially with a stranger, like holy shit, like I would never walk up to somebody on the street and just like stare them down on the street and not say anything and just stare. But in India, that's a thing. It's just you just simply look at the person, you're gazing at them, and you're contemplating what's going to happen. And I'm the odd man out, right? I'm the, I'm the white guy in India, so it's like it, it makes sense that people would stare like, why is this guy on the train in this part of the country? It doesn't make sense. So the whole family is sitting, as far as you guys are, closer even, just staring at me. And I'm like, okay, now I don't know anybody in the country. Boxcar, family staring at me. This is really awkward and scary and weird. But it goes on for like an hour that they just stare at me, no contact. And I try to smile, I'm like, you know, and then they don't smile back, and now I feel awkward and weird times two. It's just like not going well. Train stops at another town, and on the train platform is an entire company of Indian soldiers, and they are in full battle regalia. Like, they're going to some sort of, like, like uh, exercise or practice or something where they have their guns and machine guns and bazookas and literally hand grenades and like like Rambo with the bullets across the chest and everything. And there's like 50, 60 of them on this train platform. The train stops and these guys get onto the train one at a time and they start loading up this car where we're sitting and sitting all around us. So now there's an, an Indian family sitting right across from me staring at me. And there are 50 or 60 heavily armed men all around me, packed in, like as close as you guys are even closer, 
all staring at me, and everyone's staring at me from like, the guy next to me is staring at me from like this far away, and he's got a fucking machine gun. And I'm like, holy God, what do I do now? So the train keeps going, and I'm like, fuck, I should have just stayed at home and been miserable about being broken up with. Like, this is fucked. So the train rumbles along, the train rumbles along, and finally I just cannot take it anymore. And I remember that in my pocket, for whatever reason, from the last show that I did, I had some of these balloons that I used to blow up for like little kids. So I reach into my pocket and I pull out one of these balloons and I don't say a word and I don't smile. I just blow, like I'm not like a clown, like hey, hey, like I'll just like blow up this balloon and I blow up this balloon and these two little kids are like, what? And I twist the balloon off, right? And I start twisting it into a dog. And as I do, like the little kids are like, what is happening? And I finish the dog, I hand it to the boy and he's seriously like, what? And his sister's what? And the mom is like, oh, you know? And the dad is like, what? So I blow up another one, I hand it to the girl. And then I, 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 I start blowing up another one and I turn and I look to the guy next to me and all these guys with like the guns are like, what? So I hand a fucking balloon dog to the guy with the machine gun next to me. And this entire company of Indian soldiers loses their fucking mind. They're all like, what? And they're screaming. They're just like, ah! Right? And the kids are like, ah! You know, so I, I start blowing up balloons. I cannot blow up balloons fast enough, and these guys are like arguing with one another, trying to like like push their guns aside to get like a balloon. And I made, I made so many of these fucking balloons, and the train is rumbling along, and the guys are like playing with their balloons. I mean, you've never lived until you've made a man happy who's got like a fucking AK-47 and a poodle dog, and you can't decide which is cooler. You know, and he's like, fuck yeah. So the train finally lumbers to a stop. And the family, you know, gets gets off the train. I'm like, bye, waving, you know. And like, at the next stop, you know, this, the, the the company of soldiers gets off the train, and they're like waving to me from the platform. You know what I mean? It's like, holy fuck! Like, I couldn't even believe it. I've just never been like more exhilarated and scared. Like, because I mean, my, my fear was I start to blow up a dog for one of these guys, and it would pop, and they would assume that that was the war, right? And it was all of a sudden it was all just shot dead. But it was this insane moment of like. Oh my God, like cross culturally, like there's like real connection happening. And like I felt so alive in that moment. And I find that every time I go out to speak, no matter, you know, no matter what country I'm in, and it's like, it's, it's always so awkward to come to a show where I don't know anybody or I don't speak the language. Or like when you guys were playing, you know, you'd say like things that were obviously meaningful to everybody here. And everybody would be clapping. And I find myself clapping. I don't know what, what you've just said, but I'm clapping. And I remember once I did a spoken show in Germany, and there were, I was standing next to my German friend. And there was a, 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 a band from the U.S. on stage, and they were they were playing. And the guy on the stage said something. I can't remember what it was. But after he got done saying what he said, these uh, people just started clapping. And these two German guys next to me, they started they started clapping too. And my German friend next to me heard one say to the other, why are you clapping? You don't speak English. You don't know what he said. And this guy who's clapping was like, yeah, I don't know. Everybody else is clapping. I'm like, what is less punk than that? You know, like, what is less punk than me 30 minutes ago? being like, oh, I got to be. Fuck yeah. What else you just said? You know, you tell a joke and everyone's laughing. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. I don't even know what the fuck I'm laughing about. But it's just fun, right? Cross-culturally, that's where the healing happens. That's where the transformation happens. It goes from being like, where am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? I, I feel this like heartbreak to all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I feel something different. And all of a sudden that transformative moment, then you're in the rest of your life. Uh, you know, I, I had a similar experience to that Indian story when I was in Haiti. I, I run a nonprofit called 100 for Haiti. Uh, we, uh, it's a very, very small nonprofit. It's me and a couple friends. And we do support work in Haiti around uh, water quality, uh, anti-violence and anti-sexual assault and putting roofs on houses for people. You could check it out at 100forhaiti.org. But uh, I go to Haiti quite often. And, and after the earthquake, I found, myself, uh, I found myself in Haiti. And it was a time where I didn't really know anybody, right? Like now I've got a lot of contacts there, but years ago I didn't have many contacts. And there was one point where I had to rent a car in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, and drive through Port-au-Prince and meet some other people at night. Now, what I've just described to you sounds perfectly normal to anybody from Iceland, Europe, United States, anywhere. In car, across a city, at night, meet somebody. No problem. Okay, Port-au-Prince after the earthquake was like, I mean, I can only say it with a smile because it was just that 
insane. It was apocalyptic, obviously. Many, many people died. But after the dying stopped, it was still apocalyptic. Fires burning in the streets, like live like power lines all across the road. People wandering everywhere. In, in Haiti, there's no like, you drive on the right side of the road, they drive on the left. It's like all lanes are open season at all times in both directions. <laughs> the larger vehicle wins, smaller vehicle, fuck you. It's constant, it's insane. You, you honestly have to have nerves of steel to drive in this country. And I'd never driven in the country before. So I'm driving by myself, it's nighttime. And my friend had told me, meet me at a gas station uh, that was in this you know, one part of town. And I managed miraculously to find this gas station. And it's, it's night, it's dark, the gas station is shut down. And as I pull into the gas station parking lot and I'm by myself in this rental car, I'm sitting there and the only people I can see around me are these uh, two armed security guys who have been hired by the gas company to watch this gas station to prevent looting in the night. One thing that I found that works everywhere on the planet even beyond the animal balloon thing, which was a fluke that it saved me in India, was uh, always have lollipops with you. If you've got a bag of lollipops with you, you will survive any situation anywhere on the planet. I don't care where you are, you could be in Iraq, Somalia, no matter where it is, if you've got lollipops, I mean, don't hold me to this, like if you get shot in the head in Somalia, it's like, fuck you, you were there. But the point is, it's like <laughs> lollipops will help uh, in many, many, many situations. And I had this bag of lollipops with me. I'm sitting in this parking lot and these two uh, Haitian guards, both with uh, shotguns, are standing over on the side. And I'm sitting in the parking lot of the gas station. I was like, oh my God, what looks more conspicuous, nothing, than me sitting here in this car in their parking lot at night with the car idling, like I'm getting ready for to get away in the parking lot. And I'm sitting there and I look across and the two guards are conferring amidst each other. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? One of them starts walking over to me and I'm just trying to like stare straight down and like mind my own business. He knocks on the window and he looked like a police officer, at least he was dressed that way. He knocks on the window with his gun, the end of his gun. And uh, I roll down the window and he starts talking to me in Creole and I don't speak Creole. I speak French, but like a little bit. Like if a very small, very stupid French child walks in here, we could have a very basic conversation. Like, like that's it, like, you know, bonjour, bonjour, I am Jacques, I am Greg, hello, I have an apple, like that kind of stuff. So this guard starts talking to me in Creole, and I, I start answering him in English, like that's the first line of defense. I'm like, and I'm talking to him colloquially, meaning like, rather than, excuse me, sir, I do not speak Creole. I'm just like, hey dude, I don't speak Creole, I'm sorry. Hoping that he'll just get confused and walk away. But he see, keeps coming at me in Creole. And then I hear, he's asking me, do you speak, what language do you speak other than English? Like, do you speak French? And I'm like, okay. I'm like, oui, je parle un petit peu français. You know, I speak a little French. So he starts speaking to me in French, and he is hammering me. Why are you here? Why are you in this parking lot? What are you doing? And I'm barely understanding him. I'm like, I'm like, uh, je regrette. You know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for my friend. And I, the more I try to answer his questions, the more I realize how sketchy it sounds because I sound like a four-year-old being like, I didn't put my hand in the cookies, I swear, you know? So I'm, I'm trying to answer him and he's getting angrier and angrier. And it's scary when somebody's standing next to you with a gun and you see their hands tighten on the gun. So then I was like, okay, lollipops, it's time. So I, I keep talking to him and I turn and I start reaching this way, and I'm like, I'm like, say d'accord, say d'accord, meaning like, it's okay, like I'm not reaching for a gun, I'm very clearly reaching for this bag of, I, I grab some lollipops, and I hold the lollipops to this angry man with a gun, and I say, excusez-moi, est-ce que tu aimes les bonbons? Which means, excuse me, do you like candy? <laughs> and the guy looks down at me, he goes, oui. <laughs> And I'm like, pour vous, you know, for you. Like the more formal version of like you use for like your grandmother or the Pope or something, you know, for you could be like, for you, you know, but I'm like, for you. And he like reaches out, he takes the, the handful of lollipops. He's like, okay. And he walks away, starts walking, he starts walking away. And I'm like, oh my God, I just diffused violence with lollipops. This is cool. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and he walks over to his friend and I'm like, I wonder if the second guy is gonna come over and how this is going down. And I sat there for a few more minutes and finally the second guy walks over, same deadly serious look on his face with the gun in his hand. 
and he just stands there. He doesn't even say anything. He just stands there, like, waiting. And finally, I was like, est-ce que tu aimes les bonbons? He's like, oui. Like, <laughs> grab a handful of lollipops. He takes them, no expression, no thank you, just walks away. I'm like, oh, fuck me. So, like, totally diffused the situation. And it was, again, like, one of these situations, like with India, you know, where, like, where just a little bit of risk has incredible reward. And, you know, the same thing with that Haiti situation. A little bit of risk, incredible reward. Was I going to get shot in Haiti? Probably not. Maybe. Who knows? You know, was I going to get killed by the Indian army? Maybe. Probably not. You know? Am I going to die coming to Iceland because it's unusual to speak to a room full of people I've never met before? You know, probably not. Uh, I'm not going to die. Uh, but quite to the contrary, in India and in Haiti... And here tonight, like I feel revitalized when I hear people laugh or when I see people connect, even in the midst of telling like the context of the story, which was a breakup and a sad time back in December and January. And all of a sudden I'm like, holy shit, this is how we make it through. Like we're all doomed ultimately. Like a hundred years from now, we, this collective is not sitting here, the same people sitting here being like, oh yeah, God of Year just played. We saw them every year, you know, for the last hundred years. Like they're still kicking ass. Like this is so awesome. No. We're food for worms. We are fucking dead. Long forgotten 100 years from now. Sorry to bum everybody out, but it's like true. Like the chance of any of us like even lasting 100 years, let alone 500 years, 200 years from now is zero. Like name one person who lived like on this block 375 years ago. You can't. Like I, I do this. I think about this all the time. Like if I'm in New York City, like name one person who was alive in 1712 who wasn't famous here, you know? Most people just live and die and disappear. That's what we get, we get to live and die and disappear. But in the midst of living and dying and disappearing, in the midst of it being scary, in the midst of it, us not knowing what's gonna happen, in the midst of us being sad about breakups and how hard it is to just be alive in the world as a human being, like we make the best of it, we do what we can, we reach out, we connect. We, in the midst of sadness, or in the midst of the breakup, or in the midst of feeling scared, we keep going, and that's what we do. And I, you know, one of us dies first in this room. I don't want to know who it is. You know, I, for your benefit, I hope it's me. But like, I hope it's not me for my benefit, right? But you know, ultimately, like, we're all kind of screwed. But in the midst of being screwed, we come together and collect like this, and we do what we can to make connections happen. Uh, last night on the radio, I did two radio shows uh, with my friends down here, Seba Yen and and Tim. Um, the second is not yet seen the light of day, but hopefully it will at some point. It was. Um, it was an experience. Yeah, it was an experience. Did anybody listen live on the radio to the, the, the show that we did last night? You missed out. We lost our fucking minds. Um, but anyway, it was pretty fun. But the show that, that Yon and I uh, did yesterday was pretty cool. The reason that I bring it up is because at the end, you said something that was very interesting that triggered my mind all day long. And what you said was, we were talking about connection, and you said the littlest bit of connection can snowball into something much, much bigger. Um, and I thought about that, that all day. I thought about all the times in my life that a little bit of connection has snowballed into something much bigger. How one day in Reykjavik, buying a book two years ago, snowballs into you know me finding myself again over the last 10 days, and then coming here and speaking with you, the littlest bit of connection snowballs into something more and more significant. And I think that more than anything else has been kind of like my takeaway from Iceland so far is that like, you know, I came here thinking like, I wonder like if I'm gonna find a sense of solace in my mind, a sense of, a sense of peace, and I most definitely have found more of that. But I've also found connection that I never expected to find that will snowball into something, into something bigger. Um, I sing in the United States in, in three bands, a band called Trial, and a band called Between Earth and Sky, and a band called Bystander. And a few years ago, Between Earth and Sky was on tour in, in Europe. And we're unknown. We're like a bunch of friends who decided to go on tour in Europe. And we didn't deserve to do that. We just did it. So we were in, in Zagreb in Croatia. And we were playing a squat there. And after the show, we're standing in the courtyard of the squat. And there's like fires burning and people cooking tofu with dreadlocks. And it was pretty awesome. Um, and I'm standing next to Tom, who plays bass in Between Earth and Sky. Tom stands about this tall. He's bald. He looks like the Buddha. He has the same kind of vibe as the Buddha. Nothing phases Tom. Like a truck could crash into him and all of his children. And he'd be like, 
and to be. Like, nothing phases Tom ever. And he's a good grounding source for me because oftentimes I'm just like, oh wow, the microphone just moved. My life is over. You know, so like I freak out. But Tom's like, no problem. So as Tom and I are standing there talking, this Croatian guy walks up and he stands right about here and he's just hanging out. And he's most definitely in my personal space, as you say, right? And I don't mind, necessarily. It's just a bit unusual to have a, a, a guy just standing here just kind of, like, hanging out. And I look at him, and I smile, and he kind of nods his head. I'm like, okay. Um, and I keep talking to Tom. And I said, how you doing? He's like, hmm. he just kind of makes a little guttural, you know, sound and doesn't say anything. I was like, okay. So uh, finally, he says to me, you are great. Of trial, <laughs> and I said, uh, "Yeah, I, I am. I'm, I'm Greg of, of trial. Uh, very nice to meet you." He looks at me, dead serious, right, right in the eye, and he says, "May I pinch your ass?" <laughs> and I was like, "I, I'm sorry." And he says, "May I pinch your ass?" And I was like, I looked at Tom, and as I looked at Tom to say, "The fuck did he just say?" The guy says, "I must do this." And I look at Tom, and Tom goes, he must do this. <laughs> I'm like, am I being set up? Like, what is happening? So I look back at the guy, I'm like, you must do this? He's like, I must do this. I'm like, okay, if you must do this, then you must do this. Go ahead. So the guy uh, goes in for the, the, the pinch. And it wasn't just a pinch, it was like a grab of ass. Like, this guy went for it. Like, and I don't have much, but he went for like the whole handful. So this guy is like grabbing. He's not like he grabbed, let go. Like, ha ha, it was a joke, you know? He grabs and he continues the grab. So now I've got this guy standing here holding onto my ass. I don't know why, but he must do this, right? So, and it's fine. I'm like, all right, bring it on. Like, it's an interesting way to make new friends. So I say to him, um, uh, Good? And he's like, yes, I must do this. I'm like, okay. Uh, and then he says, Would, may, I, may I say to you why I must do this? I was like, fucking please, yes, say to me why you must do this. So he goes on to tell me uh, that his brother, and I'm not going to try to do his accent or anything, but he tells me that his brother uh, was a heroin addict for many years, and he tried many different ways to quit using drugs. And he one day happened through one of his friends upon a trial CD, and he read the lyrics in the CD, and we had talked about Straight Edge in, in one of our early records. And he didn't know what that was, so the brother, you know, who's using heroin, found out about Straight Edge and started researching other bands who were Straight Edge, not drinking and not using drugs. And when he realized what was happening, that there was people out there in the world who were not drinking and not using drugs as a lifestyle choice, he thought to himself, maybe I could try to do that too. And this guy is telling me the story, saying that eventually his brother managed with a lot of support and a lot of help to quit using heroin, and he credited back Straight Edge, and he credited back finding this trial CD as the reason that he quit using heroin. And by the end of this story, like I'm like, holy shit, that's amazing. And I'm like, Tom is like crying, and I'm like, that's fantastic. And the guy's very satisfied. And I was like, the only one question remains. I'm like, my new Croatian friend, there is no relationship whatsoever between your heartwarming, very lovely story about your brother's survival from narcotics and the fact that you're holding my ass in the middle of the night here in Zagreb. Uh, keep going, because there's got to be more. Right? There's one more step until I go home and you know understand what's happening here. So he said that when he said he was going to see the band of Greg of Trial, see Between Earth and Sky play, that his brother was like, you must meet Greg Benick. He's a god. And this guy said to his brother, he said, Greg Benick is not a god. There are no gods. Greg Benick is a person just like anyone else. And he said, I will prove it. I will go to the show tonight and I will meet Greg of Trial and I will pinch his ass. And I was like, now you're talking. That's the rules. <laughs> So he hung out for a while, continuing to hold my ass. Eventually he let go, and I was just like, God damn it, that's so good. Uh, and he walked away into the Croatian, in, in the Croatian night. But um, what I got from that story, ultimately, like what I, when I think about that story, is exactly what you were talking about. The littlest bit of inspiration leads, the littlest bit of like effort, the littlest bit of connection snowballs into something so much more dramatic and so much more incredible. And if you had told me when I got involved in hardcore, when I was like 17 years old, that ever in my life, anything that I wrote would influence anybody, 
that anyone would care, that any room full of people, whether in Reykjavik or St. Petersburg or wherever, Paris, wherever, would come out and listen to me talk for a while and make a connection. I never would have dreamed it. I especially never would have dreamed, like ultimately, that, 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 that like the lyrics could get somebody to quit heroin. Like it was insane. The littlest bit of inspiration, and hardcore oftentimes comes from sadness or from, from frustration, led to this guy's life changing. You know, this heart, this guy, you know, using heroin, led to his life changing. If that was the only thing that came of all of my artistic endeavors, I'd feel, all right, that's good. Like all the years of doing all this punk rock, hardcore speaking, whatever, were, were justified. But imagine what happens when we take our pain, the breakup, the, the loss, and we actually try to do something with it to transform ourselves. The, the net result is like, we might actually transform other people. We might transform like somebody's life, like this guy in, um, this guy in, in Zagreb's brother. Like I never, I never imagined it. And I guess the point is that we can't take for granted our process when we're feeling sad, when we're feeling a, a deep loss, when we're feeling like there's no warmth left in the world. Like it's our responsibility to stay in the process and create something from it because we never know how that's going to snowball into something far more, far more significant. You know, and I, I know that oftentimes like I've, I've ended up like taking, you know, that process for granted. I've taken like myself for granted along the way. And it's just, there's just, it's, it, it can't be done. Like we, we always have to remember like the potential of all of this to really expand into something greater. Uh, I have one more story for you, and then I'll uh, let you go off into the Icelandic evening, as it were. Um, there was a, uh, a moment where I learned the ultimate lesson about taking people for granted at face value and not diving in, not diving in deeper. Uh, about, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so? And I should actually backtrack. Um, I've been, uh, do, you, do you know who George Romero was? Does the name ring a bell to anybody? George Romero was the guy who created zombies, essentially. He created zombie culture uh, by creating a movie called Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead. The reason that we have The Walking Dead on TV now, I'm addicted to the show, maybe you're not, but the reason we have the show is because of George Romero's influence. And when I was growing up, the Dawn of the Dead movies meant the world to me. Like, the, you know, they just meant the world. And Romero was trying to do something very significant with these movies. In Dawn of the Dead, they were set in a shopping mall where our heroes run to the shopping mall and they barricade themselves in away from the zombies who are encroaching and trying to get into the mall. On first value, it looks like just a horror movie. But what Romero was doing was warning all of us. He was making a huge statement with Dawn of the Dead. He was saying, be careful lest you become the zombies trying to get into the shopping mall to buy stuff. That's all of us. We're all the zombies. We're just going to keep buying stuff forever like we're the undead. And he was saying, be careful lest we become that. That's why he made these movies. I was always fascinated by it. So he died a couple years ago, and it was, it was sad. But at least, you know, I had The Walking Dead, and I was, like, totally addicted to this show. So anyway, a, couple, a few years ago, I'm sitting in front of uh, Trials Facebook, and we get a, a notification. Somebody sent a message. And I click on it. And it's a, it's a video. Some guy who I didn't know has sent a video to the trial Facebook page. And the video is this guy, and he shot a selfie video in his car as the car is parked. And I don't know what the term is in Icelandic. Every language has a term for this. In English, uh, in the States, the slang term is bro. Like a, a guy's a bro. Like the, he's got a backwards baseball cap on. And like he's like... Um, he just drinks a lot of beer, he just like hangs out, he loves his metal, he loves, you know, I, I don't know what, what the term is, the colloquial term locally is for that guy, but we call him a bro. So this guy's kind of a bro. He's in his car, and the selfie video is this. Trial has a song called Reflections, and it starts off with hi-hat cymbals for a couple bars, and then a riff comes in for a couple bars, and then after that, my vocals come in for, through, through, through the song. And this guy's selfie video is him sitting in his car and he's listening to reflections on his car stereo. And he's filming himself doing this. And the hi-hats come on and he starts thrashing. Like he's going for it. He's got the camera set up on the dashboard. He's going for it, this hi-hats. And then the riff comes in and he's got the horns. He is losing his mind. He's thrashing. He's dead serious. He's not like making fun of the song or metalheads. He's like 
He's seriously flashing. And then when the vocals come in, he starts singing along, but he's singing all the wrong words. And I know it because it's me. Like, I can tell like that it's the wrong words. And he's going fucking crazy. So I, if the video's only like 30 seconds, 40 seconds long. So I, I watch the video. I get done watching the video. And I'm just about to forward it to all the other guys in the band and say, you've got to watch this fucking idiot singing Reflections Wrong in his car, right, in wherever he's from. And, uh, and then I was like, wait a minute. I can't do that. I can't get lost in the story of, like, this guy's a, a jerk. Maybe he's just very sincere, right? So instead of sending the video to the guys in the band, I write to the guy. And I'm like, hello, guy. Um, thank you for the video. Thank you for sending the video. He writes back immediately. He's like, hey, dude, no problem. And I'm like, cool. He's like, he says, who's this? And I'm like, it's Greg. Kind of says it on the profile, Greg Benick. It's like very obvious. Uh, it's Greg. He's like, cool, who are you? And I'm like, uh, I'm in trial. And he's like, what do you do in the band? And I'm like, ego. <laughs> I'm like, I, I sing. He's like, sick. He's like, what's it like being in a hardcore band? And he's being dead serious. He's not even making fun of me. He's being serious. He's like, what's it like being in a hardcore band? I'm like, it's fun. He's like, uh, have you heard of Straight Edge? I'm like, yes. Have you heard of moshing? I'm like, yes. He's like, do you ever mosh? Um, yes, sometimes, rarely these days. He's like, are you Straight Edge while you mosh? I'm like, always. You know, it's like back and forth with like these like crazy exchanges. And he's asking me like a hundred questions about like, have you heard of Agnostic Front? Have you heard of Minor Threat? Have you heard of, yes, yes, seven seconds, yes. Have you heard of Sick of All? Yes. It's like a, a million questions about hardcore and whatnot. And finally, there's a pause. And I'm like, okay, he either died or walked away from his computer. And he says to me, can I interest you in, in, in my art? And I'm like, oh God, here we go. Like, this is where he sends me like a demo that sounds like, rice and Metallica and it's all blended and it's just like I'm like um sure and he says uh I'm I'm an actor and if you have any interest maybe you'd like to watch me on a show because I'm going to be on a show on Sunday and I said sure what show he's like well on Sunday I'm going to be on a show called The Walking Dead and I was like what <laughs> and I'm like you're on The Walking Dead and he's like yes I'm like what's it like being an actor on The Walking Dead and he's like it's amazing and I'm like tell me about Rick and he's like I don't know I'm like uh, you know I want to I you know date half the people on the show I'm like tell me can I do that how do I become a zombie on the show like you know so and he's like just watch Sunday and you'll see what's going on I'm like okay so I watch Sunday night Spoiler alert, but it's, it's like five seasons ago, but still four seasons ago. But this guy, if you've ever seen The Walking Dead, there's this moment where uh, this guy um, named Jareth, he's in a, in, a, in a place called Terminus, and he's like a bad guy. He lures people into Terminus and then kills them, and uh, our heroes end up in Terminus. They escape. Jareth and his henchmen chase them down to a small church, and this guy is one of the henchmen. And this guy... Like, and Jareth corner our heroes in a church, and our heroes flip the script, and they've got extra heroes, and they kill Jareth, and they kill this guy, they like bludgeon him to death, the guy who I've been writing with, with the butt of like a machine gun, and the guy dies, and I lose my fucking shit, and I write to the guy, I'm like, you're dead, and he's like, I am, I'm like, how are we writing, this is incredible, and like, go back and forth with this guy, and we just couldn't, I couldn't stop asking him enough questions about The Walking Dead. And finally, I was like, listen, I'm like, where do you live? Like, I go full lunatic. I'm like, where do you live? And he's like, I live in Atlanta. That's where we shoot Walking Dead. And I'm like, can we be friends for the rest of our lives? He's like, yes. I'm like, the next time I tour through speaking, can we like have lunch, dinner, breakfast, any combination thereof so I can ask you more questions about zombies? He's like, sure. So I found myself through Atlanta a few months later, and I wrote to him. I'm like, it's me, your best friend for the rest of your life. Can we hang out? And he said, sure. And I went over to his house, and we had the weirdest conversation. We met in person. Our conversation was like him asking me questions about like like bad religion and me asking him questions about zombies and fighting to get either one of us to answer because like he wasn't interested in talking about zombies and I was like I don't give a fuck about punk rock dude if you're on the walking day. So um, but we eventually formed this really great friendship. And over the course of the day, I had an idea. I was like, dude, we gotta go out to your car. We go out to his car and we reshot the video. So now <laughs> there exists a video 
of reflections where the hi hats come on and this guy is like selfie video and he's like rocking out and then the group comes in and he's rocking out harder and the lyrics come on and he's fucking singing all the wrong words and as he's singing all the wrong words now the phone turns to the passenger seat and I'm in the passenger seat looking at him like what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> it's so good right but it was just this awesome moment and I mean I'll close with this just it was this awesome moment where you know had I shut the guy down before I even had a chance to see what he was all about. I would have never had the chance for that connection to snowball like you suggested, Jan. And if I had shut down the idea of coming to Iceland because I was so upset in December and January before I had a chance, I would never have had a chance to meet 30 you know, new friends in a room tonight. So my invitation to all of us, as we live a life that inherently is hard, no matter how easy your life is, no matter if your country is like in the top 10 status you know, of living countries on the planet, it doesn't matter, it does not matter. The wealth, the relative wealth of our country does not matter. Living is hard when we know that life is finite. In the midst of that, our, my invitation to all of us is when things get rough and when things get hard and we when we have substantial loss, to dive in further to connection, to reach out to friends and to reach out to possibility and to explore the idea that in the possibility might be a snowball effect that could lead to something truly great, whether it's a new friendship, whether it's transforming somebody's life or even having ourselves and our hearts feel better. That's what I came to say tonight, everybody. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening and hanging out for a little while. I totally appreciate it. If, uh, if, if people are interested, and you might not be, there's absolutely no, no obligation or anything. I, um, I, I brought along copies just to sell to support the expenses of, uh, not the expenses of me sitting in hot springs, that's on me, but the expenses of the, of the tour. Um, copies of uh, Trial, the early years. It's a double LP. It has uh, the, the first two Trial 7 inches on it, and then uh, a, a redone version of our demo. And uh, I don't even know what double L LPs sell for in your country, but whatever they sell for, less than that. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, I don't, what's a double LP sell for in your country? Probably like 10,000. That's absolute madness. <laughs> I hope you're kidding. Because uh, I was thinking like 2,000 or something like that. But I've got, I've got a bunch of them, and the more of them that you buy, uh, the less that I have to carry home. Um, and that wasn't supposed to be a double LP, actually. Robert from Refuse Records bothered me for many years to put out a trial early years LP, single LP. Robert is a completist. He loves putting out early recordings of bands and finding bands from around the world, from different countries, where you know people have not heard. You know, he put out the first hardcore band from Macedonia. I think he put out their vinyl. But um, he wanted to do a single LP, and he asked me for our demo and our first two seven inches. Can we play this record? And I was like, of course. So we put on the record, and he's listening to the demo, and his ear is so sharp. He's like this is not the version of the demo that you have sent me. And I'm like, oh shit. And I realized that when he had asked for the demo in the first two seven inches, I had sent him the two seven inches and we had re-recorded our demo at one point just to hear how the songs would sound differently. And that's the version I sent him. And Robert like crumbled. Like he'd actually, I don't know if you ever seen a human being fall to pieces into dust and just dissipate into the wind. And he was like, I cannot put out this record then. It must have all of the early material. This is not the original demo. Therefore, I have wasted all my money on this LP. And now I'm, I just lost his mind. So I'm like, uh, I will make this up to you. So I, I lent him the money to press this into a, a gatefold with two LPs in it. And we sold a bunch of the first pressing to pay me back and him back. But yeah, so it's all of the stuff, including, um, I, I think, a 20-something page booklet, which is my tour journals from the Through the Darkest Days and Foundation tours in 1996 and 1997, which is a pretty fun read. So yeah, um, 2000, I guess, or whatever you feel like paying. I've got a whole bunch of them. But anyway, uh, thank you very much for coming. And thanks to all the bands for playing. And it honestly means the world to me and makes me feel alive that we all got to hang out for a few minutes tonight. So I appreciate you very much. Thanks, everybody. And I guess if people want to hang out and talk and uh, informally be awesome, then uh, that would be really cool too. So please feel free.